us for another episode of All Allow It Nevada. This is episode seven, and we are going to be discussing day court, D-A-A-Y. I'm Anne Marie Mayu, the Supreme Court of Nevada Judicial Education Unit, your host. So you ask yourself, what is day court? I'm going to tell you. It is detention alternative for autistic youth court. This court was started by the Honorable Sony Bailey out of the 8th Judicial District Court in 2018. We have two podcasts that are going to cover all the facets of day court with Judge Bailey. Part two of this podcast series will be published on Friday, December 15th. So please remember to join us then. The Day Court is a court-supervised program for youth involved in the juvenile justice system with a primary diagnosis of autism. This court addresses clients' access to appropriate services in order to reduce recidivism in the juvenile justice system. On May 31, 2023, Nevada became the first state to pass legislation to create a specialty court for youth in the delinquency system with Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, or was suspected of having a diagnosis of ASD. Day Court, created by Judge Bailey, is the only program focused on youth with ASD in the nation. So let's learn a little bit about our guest. Judge Sony Bailey graduated from the University of Washington with a BA in Sociology in 1992 and obtained her JD from the Seattle University of Law in 96. After law school, she worked as a deputy prosecuting attorney in King County and Pierce County. She also served as a pro tempore judge in Pierce County. Judge Bailey and her family moved to Las Vegas in 2003, and she will expand a little bit more on that journey. She served as Deputy Public Defender until 2006 when she joined the law firm of Rawlings, Olson, Cannon, and Gormley. Now Olson, Cannon, Gormley, Angulo, and Stoberski. Judge Bailey was appointed the State of Nevada Deputy Labor Commissioner in 2017 and became the Acting Labor Commissioner shortly thereafter until her appointment as Hearing Master in the Family Division. As a juvenile delinquency hearing master, Judge Bailey presided over detention hearings, plea hearings, motion hearings, the juvenile sex offender court, and contested hearings. She also presided over minor guardianship hearings and discovery hearings. Judge Bailey was elected in November of 2020 to serve in the 8th Judicial District Court Family Division Department 1. She has presided over domestic and juvenile delinquency matters. She's a member of the State Bar of Washington, State Bar of Nevada, Clark County Bar Association, Asian Bar Association, and the American Inns of Court. So we really appreciate you being here today, Judge Bailey. We are excited to hear about uh, day court. And if you could kind of explain to us what uh, the function of that is. Um, The function of day court is to keep youth who enter the delinquency system out of the delinquency system and hopefully out of the adult criminal justice system by providing those who either diagnosed with autism or suspected autism by providing them services and their family services just to help them divert out of our delinquency system and hopefully prevent them from becoming adult offenders. That's great. I know you had shared with me that this is the first in the nation. It's the only one in the nation. The only one in the nation that you have started. So what inspired you to establish the court? Um, I wouldn't call it so much as an inspiration as it was born out of necessity. Um, And so what occurred is uh, back in 1998, and I remember it was in April, (laughs) in April of 1998, some officers approached me and said that they had a youth on the spectrum in detention and no one knew, no one knew what to do with them. He was in for a battery domestic violence. They weren't sure what to do with them. The parents weren't quite ready to take him home and he was overstimulated and they weren't sure how to handle it. And so At that time, my Thursday afternoon was a little bit of a more quiet calendar. Mm -hmm. So I put him on the afternoon calendar all by himself just to kind of hopefully not have him overstimulated. And then we could handle his case. And it was just uh, a a better environment for him. And so we started there. And the next thing I know, some officers came up and said, we have an autism court. And I said, what are you talking about? No, I don't have an autism court. I have one child I'm seeing on a Thursday. And they said, well, we've got another kid for you. I said, what are you talking about? And they said, we have another kid. 
And so I said, fine, put them on for Thursday. And so we put both of them on for a Thursday. And the next thing you know, I had another officer calling and saying, well, I've got a kid for your autism court. I said, again, we do not have an autism court. <laughs> um, and they said, well, we have a kid that has autism. And the next thing we know, I'm asking the officers, I said, well, do we have an issue here? And they said, well, yes, we do. I said, well, what have, been, what have we been doing with these kids? And they said, well, we've been crossing our fingers and hoping nothing happens. And so luckily I had a DA and a public defender and a probation officer who said, hey, uh, why don't we have them coming on Thursday so it's quieter? A lot of these kids were out of custody at the time. Some of them were in custody. So we just started setting them up once a month on that Thursday afternoon. And that's kind of how day court started. That's awesome. So has it been just through your work as a judge that you knew what they needed or, or do you have some other specialty in knowing exactly how to best help an autistic juvenile sit in front of you? I am the parent of a, of an autistic child. My daughter's now 25 and we actually moved to Nevada in order to obtain services 20 years ago. It's now been 20 years. Um, So it's kind of crazy. It's been 20 years. My daughter uh, was diagnosed at two, which is very rare. We were fortunate that I guess fortunate, unfortunate. I don't know how you would phrase that, but she was diagnosed at two because she's considered back then they called it low functioning. Now they call it level one. She was completely nonverbal. She would sit in a corner and just kind of rock all day. By age three, she had explosive, for lack of a better word, tantrums. She became violent, which when you have an autistic child um, who's first diagnosed at a young age, back then they didn't tell you that these children could become violent until they start hitting and beating their head against the wall or things like that. Then you go to the doctor and they would tell you, oh, by the way, these children can become violent. So you're like, thanks, what do I do? And they didn't really tell you what you could do. There weren't any services, you know, Google wasn't very helpful then, you know, the internet wasn't super great. And so she got to the point where she was so violent that she could get out of a five point restraint car seat and she could attack me in the middle of the freeway. She dislocated fingers. She's broken my foot. She's herniated four discs in my neck. She could put her head through the walls and it just got very dangerous. So by age five, we had been on a list. There was only one place in Seattle that would provide services. And at age five, she aged out. We couldn't get any services. And so at that point, the doctor said, well, you need to put her in a home because we think she's going to kill you at some point in life. And so it was either put her in a home or do something and we weren't going to put her in a home. So we started researching and my former college roommate lived in Henderson and she had found this newspaper article here and it was about this program here in Vegas. And she said, this program sounds really good. You should come check it out. And you should, you should contact this woman who's in this newspaper article. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we're in Seattle. You don't just randomly contact people. This is a land of serial killers. You just don't reach out and talk to people. And so she said, well, you should do it. And I thought, well, we're desperate. We didn't know what to do. So I reached out to this person and I was shocked. This person messaged me back. And not only did she message me back, she said, why don't you come down to Vegas and see this program? And her name is Jan Crandy. And she's one of the forefront of um, bringing appropriate autism services here to Las Vegas. So we flew down, we checked it out. And actually I was shocked when I met with Jan Crandy. I also met with Eric Lovas uh, of the Lovas Center. And it's his father who pioneered applied behavioral analysis, which is behavioral modification for those on the spectrum. And we got to go and meet a couple families and we looked at it and said, this is just amazing. This is, this is like an amazing program. We're not sure if it would work for our daughter, but we really want to try it. And so what we did is we thought, well, you know what, let's kind of throw caution to the wind and let's apply for some jobs. I was an eight year attorney, pro tem judge at the time. I thought, well, let's see if we can get a job. We get a job, we're meant to move and and try out this program. So I applied as a law clerk at the public defender's office and I got the job. So we moved down here in 2003 and we started as um, in ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis at the, the time, and it was life changing. Back then, insurance didn't cover it. So we had to learn how to do it. So I was taught by Lovas and, and our, um, you know, our, by our BCBAs, the Board Certified Behavioral Analysts, I think, or something along those lines, but by our BCBA to run this program and to be able to deal with her behaviors. And she was able to go from 250 aggressive acts per day down to now at age 25, about one every four months. So through that training is how I learned um, about autism and behaviors and the function of behaviors and how this program can help. And so when I see the parents who come in with these children who have autism or suspected autism, 
when I see how tired they are or, you know, how worn out they are, but they're ready to give their kids up to CPS or, you know, they want us to do anything. I recognize those feelings. And so if I can help them out and maybe give them some help in order to get to the position where I am now, then that's kind of where we try to aim to help. So, because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for this community and these programs. So we're trying to help these other parents get to the same place while helping the community, you know, the officers who respond, the teachers who are putting themselves in danger and the family who's also in danger, you know, from these aggressive acts. So we're just trying to help them benefit from some of these benefits that I was able to receive by moving down here. Wow. What a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. That is a long winded. (laughs) No, that is awesome. Uh, We really appreciate you sharing that because it's, it definitely is a journey and knowledge definitely helps. So, and you're passing all of that on. So thank you. What was your biggest challenge when you were facing establishing the day court? I think it's a, Number one, getting buy-in and having people understand autism. Uh, I remember when like my daughter was first diagnosed, you know, I was saying, oh, my daughter's autistic. They're like, oh, it's like Rang Man, you know, no big deal. Just go put her at a card table and she'll be fine. But I think people don't understand. Like I said, I was surprised. I didn't know that there was an issue with when children on the spectrum could get violent. And so people don't understand that because when you look at someone with autism, they look typical. And so, you know, you expect them to behave like neurotypical children and they're not. And so when you have that expectation that they're going to behave a certain way and they're not, it's very difficult for people to understand because some people will be like, well, why are you doing this? I don't understand why you're doing this. Um, And then the way that ABA works is through reinforcement. So we reinforce the behaviors that we want. We may do it through food, through gift cards, through, you know, verbal reinforcement. We have to figure out what benefits that child, what's going to motivate that child. And so sometimes we have problems with people saying, well, why are you doing that? You're bribing this child or, you know, you're doing this, you're teaching them that they have to get reinforcement for everything. And that's not the point. We, we have to, we have to reestablish how we're doing things because often with someone with autism, things are very black and white and we only react when they're doing something that's I'll, I'll say quote unquote bad. We're only reacting when they're doing something we don't want them to do. And if there's someone who wants attention We're giving them attention for all the wrong reasons. And so that behavior is going to increase. So what we have to do is teach them to re, you know, rethink. Um, These kids will react when they're doing good things, but you're not commenting on the times when they're calm or when they're not, you know, when they're doing well. And we have to re-trigger and rethink and, and, you know, do things differently for our brain. And it works for all kids, actually, um, when you think about it. Everyone reacts this way. And then I have to explain to parents, I need buy-in from parents. I need buy-in for our community partners. The courts were great because Justice Bell was our uh, chief at that time. And she understood this because she had background in this with her psychology and everything else. So she was all for setting up the program. And when we set it up, it didn't cost anything. You know, we were supplying our own reinforcements. People were donating reinforcers and everyone who was showing up, they're volunteers. So DRC sends somebody, you know, that's Desert Regional Services, ATAP, Autism Treatment Assistance Program sends somebody. I have two BCBAs from two programs that volunteer their time and they come in. So I actually have great support because I'll be, hey, we have a behavior. Tell me what the function is. Tell me what we should do. Hard Knocks is a, you know, they're they're PSRBST, but they're like a mentor. They jump in and they'll help out with Medicaid kids. I've got Legal Aid heard about us. So they send someone to help out with um, our IEPs to make sure they meet all the needs of our kids. And then, you know, then the court stepped in and said, hey, if we need some help getting some of these evaluations, because we can't get them in, it could be a six month to 18 month wait to get the appropriate evaluations because Medicaid will not accept an evaluation from out of state. And a lot of our kids are misdiagnosed. So we need to get the appropriate diagnoses. So some of our AA fees are used to get their appropriate diagnoses through a special, we have someone who actually a neuropsych who will work with us and discounted our fees heavily in order to get us expedited diagnoses. And then we have social um, groups such as Inclusion Fusion and Sports Social who will contract with us in order to get some social programs for those on the spectrum to help with social skills, things like that, to help reduce some of that social, uh, the social issues and teach them appropriate skills when they're out in public and at school. And so that way we can note the decrease in the behaviors. It's all about data. So we can note everything and and mark what we're looking for. And then we, we have parent training. 
person guided to teach the parents. Autism is 24 hours. It doesn't shut off at any particular time. Right. Well, it, it takes a village and it sounds like you have your village set up. That's oh yes. We have many villages. We have cities. Yes. Awesome. Many, many cities. <laughs> yes. We've grown. Uh, <laughs> we've grown. There's about 20 people who show up to support one youth. And and I can just imagine that anyone seeing that kind of support would really feel valued. Um, some do, some some are overwhelmed. Some some are not trusting because they have just they're at the end of the ropes. Right. Um, they're tired. Uh, they've been, some of them didn't even realize that their child was on the spectrum because youth will come in with every other diagnosis in the book. Usually that's one of the triggers that we have. Like recently I had a youth diagnosed with bipolar, reactive attachment disorder, ADHD, mood, you know, mood, uh, regulation disorder, intermittent, uh, explosive disorder. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else, obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm. Um, usually we have a bunch of those, you know. And that kid was 12. Um, and so, you know, they've been sent to RTC after RTC. And then after 30 days, RTC will say, well, there's, it's behavioral. And the parents are like, but what do I do? And then we'll look at them and say, well, has he ever been tested for autism? You know, because we'll start looking at the other things. And it's usually boys because boys are four to one, more likely to be on the spectrum than girls. And we'll start asking questions and then we'll get a bunch of red flags. And then if they get enough red flags, we take it to the team and we say, hey, is this one, you know, do we think there's enough red flags? We should get them tested. And if we don't think there's enough red flags, then we'll encourage them to go to a neuro and get the proper referrals in order to go get tested. And so we have a couple of those that are pending and, and we, we help them through the process as well, because some of them are like, I don't know, but that would sure be good if I could rule them out and, and just see what we have. Right. And so that we do a lot of that too. Is there a particular success story um, that stands out over all of the others? Well, we we just graduated number 62 since 2018. So we have numerous ones. Um, we have a lot of duly involved children. So we have a lot of kids that are in the foster system that cross over due to their inability to calm themselves. We call it frustration tolerance, as well as, you know, denied access, which means that they want something they they and they don't get it, then they can really have an issue with that. We had at one point in Child Haven, we had seven youth on the spectrum in one cottage. And pretty much they were rotating their way through detention. We had one of them in detention almost every day because there was a battery occurring between them with the different youth. We had one who they didn't know what to do with. He was coming in every day. And at one point he was sharpening his nails almost to little stabs. Like they, they were like, they were sharpened to points so he could use them as weapons. Oh um, so we literally had to have him come in during the, during the sessions and we would have to like make sure his nails were filed down and we would have to reinforce them with like fruit snacks in order to keep his nails flat. So that way, when he did try to grab someone, they weren't hurting anybody. And then we would heavily reinforce him uh, with everything. And we got him into ABA and we got him to the point where instead of coming in two to three times a week, we got him to over to the actual ABA place, which is clinic based, which means he went into the clinic. So, so he got out of child haven in the chaos that was there, which he could not handle, you know, and it's just natural chaos. If you're in any group home or, you know, any heavy environment, which is lots of children, even school, you know, if you're not in the proper environment, it's just so overwhelming. And he didn't know what to do with himself. So we got him into the proper environment. He actually did school at that um, location because they did homebound. And so he was there eight hours a day. And then we got him into a group home and we haven't seen him since. So he's one of our success stories. We've had others. Uh, we have another one who was in our program. We don't have any limits on who we'll take. We'll actually also take juvenile sex offenders if they are on the spectrum, because if we have someone who tells us that the offense is a is actually because of their autism, because it not it is a function of the autism and not a deviant behavior, which is what we had in this particular case. It's a it was a lack of boundaries. So it's like a you know they just don't understand where they're supposed to be like for touching or they don't understand the dating realms or, or cues or things like that. So we'll put them into ABA with the sex offense specific treatment. So the two will work hand in hand in order to deal with the, both the juvenile sex offender treatment, as well as the autism treatment, which is the ABA. And so we worked with this youth in order for him to recognize, you know, the, the society boundaries, which he didn't understand. So we dealt with that. And, you know, like I said, some of our youth, they don't understand, they think I'm black and white. So the youth was like somebody had shown him a porn video and he had seen one where 
somebody had shown him something where someone said hi, and that meant that they wanted to have intercourse. And so someone said hi, and he thought, oh, that means that everyone wants to have intercourse. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't happen, but you know, but that's just that's that, that's what he thought the signs meant. Right. So we had to teach him, no, that's not how it means, you know. So you have to teach him all the different things that go hand in hand with both the autism, not understanding with the sex offense specific training. And we were able to do that. And this person is 18, doing well, got a job at the mine, way up in uh, Northern uh, Northern Nevada, lives on his own, functioning well, uh, kept up his ABA treatment, did it for about three and a half years and was able to complete a sex offense specific training and is doing extremely well independently. That's awesome. So we were able to do that um, by recognizing that. And so if we had not had that appropriate treatment with the ABA, right. it would not have done any good because you needed the two that went hand in hand. Um, right. And, and actually what they're worried about is the recent studies, which there hasn't been a good one. The closest one we had was 2012. They estimated approximately 4% of the adult prison population has maybe undiagnosed or, or diagnosed autism. And that's roughly about 100,000 or more people in the system that were never given any treatment. So they may be in for something that could have been prevented had they been, had they gone through the day court program. I'm going to take a little commercial break now just to talk about our podcast, All Allow It Nevada. If you're enjoying these podcasts, I would like to encourage you to invite someone that you know to listen as well. All Allow It Nevada podcasts are open to the public. Thank you for your help in this. So that brings me actually perfect segue into the next question. Do we have any resources for adults in Nevada with autism in the court system? Because this is a youth program. This is a youth program. Once they get into the adult system or even once they hit 18, getting them ABA services or starting ABA services is going to be very difficult. First of all, it's going to be very difficult. You might be able to obtain an adult diagnosis for autism, but your resources are going to be extremely limited. And what you're going to have is um, ABA. It's going to be very difficult to obtain because most of it, early intervention is the key. So it's going to be very difficult to get ABA services approved and some insurances may not cover it. Some insurances will only cover it till age seven. So we have issues with some of the insurance companies. And then if they are able to get any type of services, it's going to be very limited. And so um, they're going to have to get some services. And then what's going to happen by the time they're over 18, we usually are going to see the other psychiatric issues that a lot of them already have. We're going to have to deal with which ones are going to be the most prominent. And then we're going to have to figure out which ones we have to deal with and how we're going to handle them and how they work hand in hand. It's going to be very difficult to obtain the appropriate services if we are able to even get an appropriate diagnosis. Right. Because if you have some psychiatric issues, it may overwhelm the autism diagnosis. Okay. Um, and then say you have some people who are already in an institutional setting or in a prison setting, if they become so institutionalized, we aren't going to be able to get an autism diagnosis at all. Because they become so institutionalized, it's going to be very difficult for us to part the parcel them out. Okay, which which makes the you know getting the youth that you see so much more important. Getting them the help, it's crucial. Yes, yes. Can you describe a typical session of a day court? It's hard to describe. Autism, as you hear, is on a spectrum. So every Every youth that we see is is very, very different. And so the key is once we get a youth, we have to figure out what their reinforcement is. And so if you ever looked at ABA, they have like pages and pages of reinforcements that you kind of have to probe in order to figure out what what makes that particular kid tick. And so we always have to figure out, you'll always hear us say, what's the function of the behavior? So you have to figure out, are they an attention seeker or escape avoidance? You know, are they a a person who wants uh, tangibles or are they a sensory person? So those are like the four things that autism looks at as far as the four functions. And it, and it kind of depends. Like we have attention seekers who really, really love praise um, and they love attention from any way they can get it. Like if you think about your class clowns, um, you know, people who just want people just to, Hey, look at me, look at me. So those can be, uh, they can be very easy, but they can also be very difficult um, because it's so easy to get attention, good attention and bad attention. Then we have the escape avoidance. You know, you have the runners, uh, but you also have the ones that just 
close down. And this works for adults too. I mean, you know, anytime you look at like, you know, and teenagers, anytime you go tell a teenager to go clean their room, all of a sudden they found everything that was not interesting five years ago. So, you know, we all have that escape avoidance kind of tendency, you know, and then sensory is like people, you, you see them all the time, the nail biters, you know, the people that are always doing something with their hands, fidgety. So we always look at those. So, you know, do we need to do something with them in order to do that? And then, you know, the last ones are tangibles. Those are the people that always want to play with their electronics or games or, you know, music, things like that. So I have to figure out what makes each kid tick. And so those we were saying, what's the function of their behavior? And then we look at reinforcement and then there's four types of reinforcement. We have positive reinforcement. That's when we add something in order to increase the behavior. So that's like adding candy, you know, or adding something, a a gift card, things that they like. Uh We also have negative reinforcement, which is taking away something that uh, actually will increase the behavior. The easiest one I always talk about is when I take off their GPS unit, where are they happy? (laughs) And that's usually to increase the behavior when they've been staying at home. Positive punishment is the other one. That's when we add something in order to decrease the behavior. It's usually like when I add the GPS unit. So that's, you know, I added something they didn't want in order to decrease the behavior, running away from home. Negative punishments when you take something away in order to decrease the behavior. So if someone's been acting up, you take away their cell phone, take away social media. So that's kind of the four things. So we have to figure out what's going to work in one of those four boxes to work on those, those four behaviors. And so that's what we work for each kid. And so we have to know what's going to happen with each kid and ha- what, what their function is. Right. So that's what we're always looking at for each one, which really helps to have two volunteer BCBAs right there. So, um, and then whenever something happens, we always say ABC, um, antecedent behavioral consequence. What happened? Because nothing happens in a vacuum. What triggered that behavior? So what triggered the behavior? What are we going to do about it? And so we always have to look at that. And what do we react to it? Because we do uh, what we call a natural prompts. So we tell people like they'll do something and whether or not we mean to, we react. And so we have to say, how did you react? What are we going to do? And then how are we going to change this behavior? And so we, we look at it. Sometimes we'll contract uh, depending on um, how high functioning the child is. And then we start working on those. So each child is so different because we have to figure out what makes them, uh, what, what's going to be their motivator. And so one, one kid, the biggest motivator, because um, a lot of them are on the screen because we, we do a lot on video to, to help out the parents. One, one youth just loves it when you do all the um, little emoji selections on your thing. So everyone's like, everybody get your thing out. How we doing? Happy faces, claps, and boy, that kid's happy. Mm-hmm. One kid would come in and say, what you got for me in gift cards? You know, <laughs> it's like, what you got for me today? Did, did you bring me any more Chick-fil-A? Another kid was like, hey, I want some more fidgets. You know, another kid is like, did you bring me, did you bring me my Takis? I don't know what it is about Takis, but apparently they're very special. So these are all the things that we have. And then, you know, someone's like, I want to go to Sports Social or, you know, that's our program or Inclusion Fusion may have a movie night. So you have to figure out what each one, you know, what, what's going to make each one happy. And then they'll tell you about it. And so we find out what, what makes each one happy as far as a reinforcement scale. And then once in a while, you got to reinforce the parents too, because, you know, they're trying. And so each youth, when they come in, it takes a long time to get us started, to get us in programs, there's wait lists, things like that. So they may come in on numerous charges that have to be bundled before we can get going. So we have to figure out what we've done each time between each session and where we're at. So we get constant reports and then you're always trying to find something positive. And we do the sandwich you know, the sandwich method, positive, focus, you know, the, the negative and the positive. So you're always trying to build that in. Always try to find something that you can build on the positive because you always got to find something good that they did. And you can always find something if you're looking for it. And so that's what we work on trying to find for the parents. It's like, hey, let's let's look for something good. Whether they picked up their shoes, put their plate, you know, in the sink, you know, did you not, you know, did you not act out in school today? Did you not get a red card? Things like that. Those are all the things that we have to teach the parents to look for rather than focusing on all the things they didn't do. Because when you start focusing on all the things they didn't do, we're just going to, it's not going to help any um, because we're never going to get an improvement on any behavior. Right. It's a lot of work. It's exhausting. It sounds like a lot of work. You're training the parents. A lot of it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You have to retrain. It's not, it's not what you think of as, as typical court because you have to rethink and retrain your brain on how you're reacting to your kid because You've been, you've been walking on eggshells. These families have been walking on eggshells, just trying to keep the peace. They don't want them breaking anything. They don't want them hurting anybody. They don't want to have to call the police. You know, there's a risk of the police coming in. There's a risk of it escalating because youth on the spectrum, when they become violent, they can have amazing strength. I mean, amazing strength. Sometimes it can be confused with those that are on drugs because it's just 
amazing. My daughter could put her head through a wall and not even feel it. And so she's broken every toe on her foot without even feeling it. And so they just don't feel it. It's kind of where they don't even, they'd see nothing but color black, you know, everything goes dark. And so it, it gets to that point and it gets dangerous to everybody. They see, you know, can escalate to a lot of people getting hurt when the parents are scared, everyone's scared. You know, it's just a risk to everybody. It's a risk to the community, first responders, the teachers, the other students. And so they've been walking on eggshells. They don't know what to do, you know, and a lot of them can't hold jobs because they've been told to come pick up their kid. They've been on a PC again or expelled or something else because the IEP may not be appropriate to meet their needs because it, you know, it may not have been a proper diagnosis or any of those things because they could be severe emotional dis- um, disturbance or it might be under ADHD or it could be something else, you know, because no one knows. So there's all these things that are going on. And then they have other children. They may have multiple kids on the spectrum because if you have one youth on the spectrum, there's a 45% chance you could have another. So they could be having multiple children like this. And so, you know, you have to look at it from their perspective of they're tired, you know, they're working, they're just trying to survive financially, emotionally, physically. And so when you have someone, you know, that's now trying to tell you, hi, now I'm going to tell you, you need to change your way of thinking. (laughs) They're like, we're too tired for this. So now we got to get gradual building. So that's why they have to see that we have a support system. So it takes a while to do that. But once we get their buy-in, it's life-changing. And they'll tell us it's life changing. It just takes a little bit of time. So we do incremental. And so we do little things to try to get their buy in. Got to reinforce the parents too. Absolutely. I bet once they get to that point, they're so relieved. They're relieved. It's life changing. They'll say, we didn't think it would work. I was skeptical when when they told me that this would be uh, life changing for my daughter. I, we were like, boy, it works with them. We don't think it's going to work for us, but Hey, if we can make it a year without any broken bones, we're going to try it. So Mm -hmm. it sounds good. And so, uh, you know, for them, it's like, Hey, can we, we need to do something because you can't keep calling the police. Our TCs aren't going to work. They aren't going to take this kid. And what happens when they hit 18? So, you know, and right now you're under my jurisdiction and we're going to try this. Right. So that's where we're at. And so that that's what we keep doing. And so we get by and once in a while we don't, but a lot of times we do. And so we, we work on it. Just, you know, we always, our motto is just one kid at a time. So we just work one kid at a time and we just want to make a difference to one. So far, 62. That's, that is amazing. With that, we'll close. I just can't thank you enough for being here and sharing your knowledge and your beautiful story on how you were able to take your experience with your own family and help our Nevada community. And I want to thank each of you for listening in. My name is Anne-Marie Mayu from the Supreme Court of Nevada Judicial Education Unit, your host. I'd like to remind everyone that all of our podcasts are accredited with the Nevada State Bar for continuing legal education. You'll need to complete a certificate of attendance and email it into jepodcast at nvcourts.nv.gov you're not sure where to get that certificate of attendance, just go ahead and send an email in to jepodcast at nvcourts.nv.gov. In addition, we're always looking for relative judicial topics, uh, as well as special guests and any questions that you may have for us. There's one place to send all that for our judicial education podcast. And again, that is jepodcast at nvcourts.nv.gov. Thank you, Nevada, for listening to our podcast. I'll allow it, Nevada.